Welcome to Crafting a Living. Thanks for joining us. Crafting a Living is a show where I interview people who live a creative life. People who manage to make a living plying their craft. So let's welcome our guest today. I ran into uh, an old acquaintance today. Um, and it must go back to the, the late 90s. Early 90s. Early 90s. In the early 90s, I met Kieran Tracy, who was distributing Zambezi Lager in those days. And I was at a, at a function, I think at the K Group, where I was introduced to Kieran, and we asked him to distribute our Bavaria non-alcoholic, the Bavaria 0.5. And that's how I came to meet you. I mean, that's where I met you, Kieran. Um, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure. Glad to be here. <laughs> Can you remember that incident? And it's interesting because I saw Robbie Mitchell earlier. He was one of the founders of of the of the keg group, and I think we had a supplies evening or something at the kegs. And, You've and got a good memory. Uh, <laughs> with, a bit frazzled off yeah. the trading terms that I've had to pay. <laughs> And I was there with Rainer Funk. Uh, you might remember Rainer. He was he owned that Bavaria Breweries. So tell us a little bit about your story. You obviously had something to do with with Zim and stuff. Your your company was called Zambezi Brands or Zambezi, yeah, Zambezi time, Beverages. We called it Zambezi Multi Level Trading. I think oh, okay. That was the shelf name company. Okay. Um, in the early days, and that was sort of ninety one, ninety two. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there was. Uh, um, a story in Zimbabwe that we had heard, um, this is before email and uh, the internet, of a new beer that was uh, developed by national breweries at the time. Um, and it had the namesake of Zambezi Lager, um, which was immediately catching. Uh, yeah. Name-wise, it represented the region. Yeah. Um, and obviously what Zimbabwe was all about. And... Uh, that sort of triggered my interest and went up and met the National Breweries guys in, in Arori, obviously a newly uh, independent yeah. country. They were keen to get into the export game. Um, I think uh, at the time, South African Breweries, SAB, had a small stake mm-hmm. in National Breweries, or Delta at the time, and uh, they were very keen to do business with us. So what, what brands were available before that? Um, look, they they produced under license. They had Castle Lager. Yeah. They had Lion Lager. Um, I think Bollinger's Black Label. Yeah, Bollinger's came after Zambezi. Oh, okay, that was a sort of a dry offering, um, but the Zambezi was sort of their um, their flagship. And that was only launched in the it 1990s. Was about 90, 91, 92 Okay, that it was launched, and and we went up and we met the guys. They were keen. South Africa was sort of going, you know, coming out of the abyss. They were interested in doing business with South Africa okay. again. I think we were um, we were talking. You know, the clerk was uh, yeah. was loosening up uh, the situation. The political arena, I guess, was changing. Um, and uh, before we knew it, we had a couple of pallets coming across the border. Um, pre-sold them all. I think all to Benny Goldbergs and uh, bootleggers and those guys you took see. it immediately. Um, and uh, I gave up the day job. And uh, which was. Which is a, a computer salesman okay. selling uh, software and uh, and hardware. So you knew how to sell. Um, I think you got to know how to sell when yeah. you're in this gap. So, yeah, uh, yeah. And we we put the house on it, and a container of Zambezi came over, went into Benny Goldberg's, and I think Macro took some of it at the time. There was one had one or two stores, and the rest was history. And that's how you started. And that's how we started. Okay. I think we spent our turnover. Um, we didn't know anything about profit and loss. <laughs> That sounds familiar. Yeah, and we used to deliver on the back of a of a 1972 Toyota Land Cruiser. Oh, I don't think we worried about a liquor license. Oh, you didn't. Okay, no, we were delivering beer off the back of a truck. Yeah, it was <laughs> easy in those days. <laughs> I can tell you stories of guys now in the township doing That's the same that, thing yeah. without licenses, and then us. Yeah, we taught them. Yeah, interesting. So and 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 uh, so. <laughs> In the early nine and and macro, I mean, they were happy to buy from. Yeah, a they took it and and Bollinger's came in online and um, you know that was the beginning and then we we saw we saw this as a there was a niche. Yeah. Um, you know there was no availability of uh, you know obviously after 
sanctions and all that um, that were imposed on the country, there was just there was no choice. Yeah. So we had uh, um, we had this sort of desire to get more and more products, and I think we took on Seoul. Um, we had two dogs. We did Budweiser. Two dogs. No, I've got. I remember two dogs. Yeah. We made that at Bavaria. Exactly. Yeah. With, uh, Michael Hazman. Yes. Yeah. It was what? me and Mike Hazman that actually started that. Oh, ah, okay. Through a guy called Duncan McGilvery from uh, Australia, <laughs> um, who actually sold it to us in the first place, and, and we sold it into Mike Hazman's uh, cricket action cricket setups. Yeah. And that's how we started Two Dogs. And Pity it didn't work. Eh? It didn't work. I think it was uh, probably a bit before its time. I think yeah. it's around still. But, not yeah. Uh, not not anymore. No. I think it's oh. come and gone. Yeah. And then Hooch came, I think. I think then Hooch. Yeah. Which, um, which we sort of managed with the Cellar Master guys. Yeah. Oh, were you involved with that? Involved with the huge brand as well. Okay. Um, and then I think that uh, also came and went. The huge, uh, but they spear- it spearheaded that whole alcoholic. Yeah. Uh, sort of. Uh, so huge is now owned finally by KWV. It's now in that stable. I think Pepsi ended up with it, and now KWV owns it. Yes. Um, and who was running Cellar Masters? That was before Linus and, and his... It was Fred Lattachan. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, Linus Van Zyl? Linus Van Zyl and Sonja Van Zyl. Yeah. It was a, a proper family-run business. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. And we ended up, I remember we ended up putting our Bavaria beers in, into that setup just before they closed or liquidated. Yes. Um, and so how long did you do Zambezi? Yeah, the Zambezi story, you know, we obviously went through... Um, through ups and downs, I think our biggest threat was uh, SA Breweries. Um, they didn't like our presence. Um, we had a had a really good association with the NTA, the National Taverns Association. Um, in fact, there was a story about uh, a boycott that took place um, where the NTA that had something like 2,000 taverns mm-hmm. in, the, in the inland area that they controlled um, in the townships and um, they wanted a, a beer that represented Africa. Yeah, um, I think they had had some some issues with SAB at the time on on, on supply or trading terms, etc. And they made the call to to boycott SAB over a Christmas period. Can you believe it? And I sat with uh, Peggy Sene um, in the early sort of 1993-94. South Africa was on this uh, on the on the edge of of a civil war. Yeah, and it was me and my partner at the time, a chap called Grant Noakes, and. Um, there were these two white guys in the middle of uh, Soweto <laughs> putting a deal together. And uh, we concluded that deal and container loads came over for that Christmas period. I think we moved something like 30 or 40 containers, wow. which was significant in those days. Yeah. And that's really what, uh, what started that whole, the whole story with Zambezi. And it, uh, uh, it spearheaded it. Um, they obviously... Um, got together with S.A. Brie and they, they sorted their issues out. Yeah. But we had a, a sort of a four-month window okay. of great sales to Soweto. <laughs> Dream. Dream sales. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and Zambezi, I think it, we had it probably until about the late 90s and then there was an issue with, um, with the supply coming out of Harare. Mm. Um, the, the story went is that one of the, the, the glass factory imploded. We also heard that, yeah. Yeah. Um, they were making a, a flint bottle, an export bottle um, that was going to South Africa. It was a lightweight bottle um, into the US, into the UK and Australia. So they had, they had smaller markets there. And um, they couldn't supply that bottle. They could only supply us the returnable bottle. So it was a heavier, heavier glass, um, reusable bottle, mm. not great presentation. It wouldn't work in, in, a, in a becoming more sophisticated South African landscape, landscape as more and more yeah. quality imports came into the market and, and we just couldn't present properly against those. Okay. And we made the decisions to stop. Do you think that was because Delta Beverages was, uh, they controlled it, eh? Wasn't that part of SAB somehow? Yeah, look, I think they were, I think that was when SAB were, were moving. I think they mm. took more, the, the government had a shareholding in Delta. Okay. They sold some of their equity um, to to back to Delta, who in turn obviously sold. I think that's how the story went. Um, and SAB took a took a, a, a larger shareholding. Yeah, um, they controlled it more, and um, and th- there was a bit of a squeeze. I think, I think sure. they, they saw it as a com- you know competing with themselves. Yeah. They didn't want independent uh, importers running product across the border. 
Yeah. So it basically fizzled out. The Zambezi ended round about sort of the early 2000s. Okay. Yeah. That's probably the last time that I was in Zim was in the middle of probably about 10 years ago and I can remember it was harder to get the empties so you needed empty gla- em- and a case of empties to even buy a beer. Correct. You couldn't buy yeah, beer. There was a shortage of glass, I think. Yeah, yeah. so that, it must have got even worse. Yeah. And then fast track to 2017, have you seen the Zambezi being sold by SAB now? In South Africa? Yeah. I haven't seen that yet. So they have just launched a pack um, of eight different African beers, which they're marketing internationally, China particularly, and the States, which has got, I think, Kilimanjaro from... That's Cap- a great idea. Yeah, it's a lovely idea. So the, all the all the iconic brands from Africa in one little eight-pack, including Castle and uh, Zambezi. They've got Laurentina Preta yeah. and uh, a couple of other brands in there. So I think that was somebody else's idea. But, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> but it's, uh, <laughs> they couldn't I won't say who, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's taken that long for it to, to get back onto the market now that everything's controlled by AB InBev. Yeah. Um, it's a brilliant idea, and, and I dare say that they can do the same with German beers, and they can do the same with sure. with um, Belgian beers. Um, I'm sure they own enough Leffers and Hochardens to exactly. to do a, a similar pack and destroy all the don't little. They, don't they own six out of every beer drunk in the world? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's interesting, and and so out of that uh, Zambezi beverages or. Yeah, I think we'd realised at that stage that um, that we were playing, you know, in a, in a sandpit that was too big for us, mm. um, and uh, it was on a on a visit to the UK that I picked up a product um, in the uh, in the beverage section at Harrods, and it was an Icelandic water in a clear can, and that yeah. was seltzer, um, and uh, I'd met with the seltzer guys in the UK, um, London, and. Uh, uh, said that we were a beverage distribution business in South Africa. Um, would you be interested in selling your product? And his first words were, not another South Africa. He said, um, we're getting so many calls from you guys. I said, well, let's move quickly. And uh, by the time I'd got back to to Johannesburg, um, we had a container on the water. Really? Yeah. And that was that really spearheaded uh, my business, yeah. um, you know, financially and uh um, and obviously uh, viability wise yeah. um, and we and when, started what the year was it? that would have been uh, around about um, 1990 probably 1996 okay that long ago that's, that's sort of yeah at least 20 years ago yeah so that's seltzer has been in the market since then okay and um, yeah seltzer was the first and followed by Snapple and uh, and Monster and we were obviously a third-party distributor for all the series, NJ, yeah. etc. here in South Africa. And, and uh, in terms of the water, were you um, were you one of the first? Was it flavoured then, or was it just pure water? Yeah, it was flavoured. Um, okay. The product was was actually manufactured in Iceland, which gave it a bit of an edge. And at the time, it was it was quite uh, revolutionary, I could mm. say, in the, in the soft drink arena. Um, it was really not much choice again. We, we saw a gap in the market. There was no such thing as a, as a clear flavoured soft drink. You know, all the products at that stage were all coloured and mm. full of artificial sweeteners. And, and this was truly the first adult soft drink. Okay. Um, it was aimed at an adult market. Um, yeah. It was slightly more expensive um, in, in packaging that nobody had ever seen, the see-through can. Yeah. And uh, the sales were phenomenal. We really spearheaded that whole flavoured water category, and obviously there's been a lot of other yeah. Me Too products and, and bigger players that have, you know, come yeah. into that landscape and done well. Yeah. Uh, but Salsa was the first. And just for for my own interest, when did the likes of Aquila start? Can you remember? Yeah, Aquila came out um, probably uh, probably about two or three years after us. Okay. You know, there was first a product called um, Clearly Cape. Yes, in, a, okay. in a glass bottle, and they were they were quite um, ambitious, and they did well in a glass bottle. They converted into PET after a while, but then they they disappeared. And Aquila sort of took that uh, took that lead, and uh, and they sort of took over their market. So it was really just the two of us okay. that sort of uh, competed. But we've seen what Aquila's done now; they've taken it to another level. Yeah, 
Um, I mean, initially they would have just been in KZN and you yeah, would have been in Joburg. 100%. Okay. Yeah. And then they, they obviously stepped up a gear and they, you know, they've done what they've done now. But Salts has done its, you know, it's held its own. Yeah. Um, obviously we don't own, we've never owned our own production. And I think that's probably been our, our disadvantage or weakness. You think so, uh, eh? You know, being a, a third party yeah. bottling. But you, you started bottling in South Africa. Yeah, we started bottling here in about 2001. Up okay. until then, it was imported wow. directly from Iceland. Can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the exchange rate played a part there as well. You know, as the rand got weaker in time, you know, it just wasn't viable to import. And with other players coming into the market, yeah. it, was a, it was a price issue. Yeah, always. So we yeah. had to make locally. Okay. And, and, uh, and that was it. And who owns the brand? Um, Supergroup Group owned. The actual brand? Oh, the Seltzer brand itself. Um, in South Africa, it's owned by Supergroup, mm -hmm. um, but there's nobody um, else globally that is doing a seltzer branded water anymore. It doesn't exist globally. Okay. Um, there Because is a, a factory in, in Wales that is producing the same product for boots, but it's as a private label. Okay. But the, the word seltzer means water or, or yeah, bottled it's a, it's, water? I believe it's got a German um, origin, yeah. um, and it means flowing water. Okay, um, but I mean, uh, I know if people talk about seltzer, they talk about bottled water. Yeah, I think it's got a generic term as yeah. well. You know, so um, it's quite a good brand that you had. In the US, you know, they call um, <coughs> sparkling water seltzer. That, that's sort of their generic okay. term for it. So people sort of, they think they know it, but mm. they don't. Mm. They've just heard the name before. Okay. So you, do you know the German joke? Or, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm from German heritage, but if, if, if the Germans want natural water it's, it's sparkling they think that's that's the, the natural version that's the natural version really. of water <laughs> and if you if you give them flat water that's not water that's really. <laughs> okay and when did I mean your other big thing was obviously um, Snapple and, and Monster when did you start those yeah Snapple was started um, around the the first World Cup in 95 um, it was it must have been difficult, expensive product. Yeah, at, at, at that stage, it was a it was a Quaker Oats. It was owned by Quaker Oats, which is that uh, that massive uh, uh, FMCG company based yeah. in Chicago. They own Snapple and Gatorade. Okay. Um, and they really wanted to push the Gatorade product uh, more than Snapple. Um, and in fact, the Gatorade product didn't work here. Um, we had probably. 70% of our inbound consignments were Gatorade and 30% Snapple. And uh, it was actually, the success was in reverse. Yeah. Um, the Snapple was the successful. That was the product that South Africans could relate to. They understood it, they got it. Whereas yeah. Gatorade, we were competing against the Parades and the Energy. Well, at the time it was Energy. Um, I think there was Lucasade as well, and then Parade to, to, at a later stage. So it didn't sound it authentic? Didn't, it didn't work. Yeah. Um, you know, as we know, Gatorade's the number one globally, but mm. uh, it's never worked in South Africa for some reason. Um, so Snapple was it, and uh, um, we, we we purchased Snapple from Quaker, and then Quaker sold the product to to Trioc, and then Trioc Beverages sold the product to Cadbury Schweppes, um, who in turn hived or uh, well, split the business, and 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 Dr Pepper Snapple was created, okay. as it is now today. So it's still a, a Cadbury's in a dotted line product, but it's run and owned by Dr. Pepper Snapple. Okay. So Snapple has been around since uh, mid-95, mid-90s, 95, 96, and uh, it's still going strong as an import. Amazing how, I mean, such an expensive product can work in a, in a country like ours. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we're quite um, US-orientated. Mm. Consumers here in, in South Africa... Um, they sort of uh, aspire to American brands in a big way. Um, and, and I think Snapple is kind of unique because there's nobody here that really competes with it. Yeah. You know, it sits in its own category. It's just too hard to get that bottle, I guess. I think it's the glass, it's, yeah. it's the way they manufacture it, it's got no preservatives and, you know, unique, uh, yeah. you know, unique tastes and, and flavors. But it's, it's, it definitely resonates and, and they've done exceptionally well in this country. And it, and it holds its own, very elastic, prices high. People still buy it. Still buy it, yeah. yeah. And uh, when did the Monster story start? At the same time? Um, no, Monster was much later. Okay. Um, I think this was this was all before the energy sort of revolution. But um, energy drinks 
really started to to create some kind of traction in the mid mid two thousands, I guess. Okay. Um, you know, Red Bull had been around for a while, but nobody had quite figured you know what it was all about. Um, and then, stroke of genius, I think it was originally Rockstar. Um, Monster followed very quickly with a big can format, mm. um, and that was really the game changer. Yeah. Um, you know, double the size, same price as Red Bull, okay. and that was the ticket into the game. Because yeah. um, I was distributing um, or redistributing Red Bull into the nightclubs and the on-trade and, and the taverns and stuff in Durban, and then along came Monster. Yeah, yeah, Monster came, and uh, it was 2007, and uh, okay. it was hard at first. You know, people were saying Red Bull is quite happy with one product. You know, look at it now, you know, how many energy drinks are on the yeah. market. But uh, Monster, with its uh, global presence and its credibility, you know, in that sports you know, extreme sports arena, um, and and a great delivery, taste and price, um, and image, um, quickly took over that South African consumer's sort of mind. And um, you know, by by two thousand and nine, two thousand and ten, um, there was significant volumes being well, imported. And bigger than Red Bull or not? Not. A, I don't think um, we ever got close to the Red Bull numbers. Okay. You know, they they're very very strong and on premise. Yeah. You know, that's their, their fortress, you know, the clubs. They pay the a lot bars. of money to stay there. Yeah, I think that they, they've, earned their, they've earned their right, you know, to control that space. Yeah. Um, you know, it's the go-to mixer. It's, it's the go-to pick-me-up in that, in that environment. So nobody and orders Smirnoff better. and Monster? Yeah. yeah or or Jägermeister and Monster? Very, very un- yeah. unusual to find that. You know, yeah. it's, it's Red Bull owns that. So, so it's a four-court supermarket? It's a four-court. It's, it's, it's on the move. It's on the go kind yeah. of uh, purchase, I guess. Um, but it, but it's a credible opposition to to Red Bull, and as okay. you can see in the states, they're pretty much neck and neck yeah. as far as volumes go. But uh, as you know, Coca Cola own a portion of Monster now, okay. and uh, they have the global distribution rights. Uh, okay, and um, they have it here in South Africa. And is it true that uh, that it was started by South Africans? Um, yeah, I'm largely correct. Um, there was a gentleman here. Um, who was uh, South African, ex-South African. He left um, Johannesburg and settled in, in California. Mm. And he bought a, a fledgling uh, beverage business called Hanson's. Mm-hmm. Um, Northern Californian origin, I think. And I'm not too sure how the story went and how they went from selling a juice-type product and going into a, you know, quite an edgy energy drink. Um, you know, that, that transition never really got that story. But I, but I think that... Um, um, that they they really understood what the consumer wanted, okay. and they worked it out. They were smart. They, the formulation was brilliant. Um, they got the right athletes and ambassadors around the brand, and um, yeah, South African, okay. um, South African guy that uh, engineered the success of Monster. Wow. And I think he's sitting on a beach somewhere in the Bahamas. <laughs> I'm sure he is. Yeah. Uh, Okay, and what what other interesting brands did you have? You also did Rockstar. Yeah, Rockstar came um, pretty closely after our contract ended with Monster. Okay, um, they they were interested in uh, in obviously trying to to emulate the success that we had uh, done with the Monster guys, and um, and especially in uh, in seeding the product in this market. Um, yeah, and I, I think it was pretty short lived. We only had a, a period of about a year and a half with Rockstar before. Um, the Zambezi beverage businesses business was acquired, yeah. um, and and Rockstar has found a new home. Okay. But uh, it, it's always battled. I think uh, at that stage, Rockstar was probably a little bit, uh, a bit too late into this market. I think um, you know you you had the the edgy type products, uh, Red Bull and Monster that had, had already um, obviously attracted and taken over the minds of the consumer yeah. in South Africa, and to have another, a third player. In that in that sort of category would be would be difficult, um, especially in the, especially uh, as an import. Yeah, and from a distance, with a bit of beer experience and lots of distribution and sales experience, the, there's so many new breweries now, new gin companies or distilleries, wanting to launch brands and start, and so many lighties wanting to start distribution businesses. I mean. What do you think the the key 
success stories or factors are for for a startup now? I mean, would you? What? Yeah, look, it's I think it's quite over traded, um, but I, you know, my sort of humble advice is, is really any startups is to is to understand your market. Mm. You know, know your business. Um, you know, and approach your market. You know, with the view that it's not going to be easy. Mm. You know, you've got to understand where your products should fit. Um, that eighty twenty rule always applies. Mm. You know, you're going to get eighty eighty percent of your business out of twenty percent of your customers. Um, and a rifle shot approach, as opposed to a shotgun approach. You know, and and building it. You know, from the foundation up rather than trying to push volumes, you know, at a large format yeah. supermarket or group and walk away. That, that does not work. And how did you do that with four courts or? Yeah, I think your your mom and pop stores, you know, up and down the high street. Okay. You know, going store by store, That's that's been my philosophy. And those aren't around anymore, are they? They're not, not so much, but okay. I, I still think that that philo- philosophy applies. You know, yeah. it's all about, you know, getting, you know, getting those influencer zones right, you know, making sure your demographics are right. Um, selling your product where people will buy your product, not sort of uh, you know shotgunning it out there and hoping for the best. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's having the right product, and it, and at the end of the day, it's got to taste good. I think a lot of people forget about that. <laughs> Might have the greatest label, the greatest yeah. bottle, the greatest price, um, a real cool name, but if it doesn't taste good, yeah. you won't get that second purchase. Okay. Yeah. And you never you never ventured into the liquor business again after Zambezi? Was no, I think we were, we were dead scared. I think, <laughs> I think, uh, big boys. I think SA Breweries, uh, um, to fight that uh, juggernaut um, was very, very difficult, yeah. you know, unless you had very, very deep pockets yeah. and large checkbooks. But, um, yeah, it's not to say that I wouldn't ever go back into, the, into that trade again. Yeah. And then um, you, you managed to... Exit your company, or what's the, what's the formal word of selling a business to a big company? To exit, uh, <laughs> yeah, look, I think it's uh, any entrepreneur's uh, dream would be to to be acquired by another business. Yeah, um, I think we were fortunate that um, we uh, we had um, a company like Supergroup that that uh, has has harbored our products. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's been it's been positive. I think it was a good thing. And the reason they bought it was because you had good contacts with with the with the Snapple guys, or, or yeah, I think I think they they saw it as a, at a time in their in their evolution that they were looking for brands to mm. add value um, to their business, and and I think they've done that. I think they're on a on a path now, yeah, um, a different path in in, in what they're going to achieve going forward and I think they'll acquire more brands yeah and I mean your success was that you you had those brands and you weren't just a generic distributor you had you had proper agreements with with those brands and that you were importing and you were the sole distributor in South yeah. Africa I guess I think, eh? I think that's part of the success is yeah. that you, you have to have that exclusivity and, yeah. and and take the time to to visit those people in faraway countries and and mm. and strike a deal okay you know sell sell the business sell sell yourself yeah, um, sell the territory, sell the country. Okay, you know, make them believe that uh, that the products are going to be looked after. That's all a principal really wants. Yeah. He wants obviously consistent volumes, and he wants to know that his his brand's going to be represented in the right way, um, and that he gets paid on time. Yeah, that that's, those are <laughs> that's really the ingredients to the recipe. Yeah, and you grew up in Zim. Obviously, um, when did you leave Zim? Um, left Zim around about 1990. Okay. Um, early 90s and, and worked, as I said, in the software, hardware, yeah. computer business for about a year or two. So I've been pretty much in the beverage business sort of my whole working life. Yeah. yeah. And uh, do you still go back to Zoom? As much as I can. Okay. Yeah. And now what's uh, positive things happening up there? Or? Yeah, I think they've got, they've got their issues. Yeah. Um, we all know that. Um, but uh, the country, the landscape doesn't change. Yeah, you know it's still a beautiful place to go to. Beautiful, yeah. You know, apart from uh, the politics and uh, the economy, you know, the economy is still down. Yeah, I think mm. we know that they've got their mm. problems. Yeah, and uh, your other big thing was was fishing, I believe. 
I remember you and George you, Broski you, you've done your, off. You've done no, your homework, no. huh? I remember. <laughs> I, used to, <laughs> I used to work with George. He says, now I'm going fishing. Oh, and then they said... Yeah, I actually saw George this morning. Oh, okay. I was with him for breakfast. But, uh, yeah, I think that's a passion, eh? It's yeah. uh, definitely, definitely one of my... And do you uh, go fishing in Zim, or where do you go Yeah, fishing? Zim is probably... Yeah, Zim, uh, fly fishing, tiger fishing, okay. green. Um, obviously trout... And uh, if I can get away, I'll do a bit of salt water as well. Okay. But, um, definitely my primary passion. Yeah. Yeah. So nothing better than a Zambezi on the Zambezi with a there with the go. I've got many, the many photographs of, of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kieran, it was nice chatting yeah. to you, and and good to share those memories that we have. And even if we if we didn't uh, run into each other that often, it was still yeah. like kind of parallel and seeing your business grow. And then I was briefly working with Supergroup Consulting to them and I remember when they were starting to to eye your business, uh, it sounds like it's it's been a good um, it was a good move and now you're still working for them, you're running a, a division yeah, for them? Yeah, they've got a brand division <laughs> um, within the Supergroup structure and uh, it's it's early days still okay. but, I, but I definitely see it um, it's got potential um, yeah. we need to obviously get more brands in, into the basket and those uh, brands you've got Bundaberg yeah there's been a few new ones that have come on board okay. um, Bundaberg uh, came across as well with Snapple and Seltzer that was also yours uh, Schecter's Organic Energy okay. um, which is which is definitely um, which is the racing niche. car guy what yeah the Schecter's name? guys yeah Jody Jody, Jody and, the and world Toby, champion Toby, Formula 1 guy Toby Schecter yeah okay. it's, his, it's his son that actually runs oh, is it is it the son um out of out of Holland, it's a UK based company, but uh, certainly has a has a, a good proposition in this country. And then um, and then Recordlik, which is a, a Swedish um, pear cider, yeah. um, out of Sweden, which uh, is definitely holding its own okay. in the category. So yeah, exciting. And there's more brands to come. Okay, good. We look forward to to seeing your brands and to seeing you in the trade. Yeah, I'd like to see you more in the trade. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Kieran. Yeah. Thanks. Cheers, Ahoga. Thank you, Kieran. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining us today. Can I ask you a favor? If you enjoyed the show, please can you share it? Share it with a friend or a colleague or anybody that you think may benefit from the lessons that we learned from Kieran today. And I look forward to speaking to you next week. Cheers.